I've hit 100 subscribers. I started compiling a list of questions to make this video and I was at 98 subscribers. And by the time I finished, I was at 100 subscribers. So thank you all for that. And with that, I told you guys I would do a Q&A video when I hit 100 subscribers. A bunch of you sent me a bunch of questions. So let's start answering your question. Next question, what's your opinion on Hollywood blockbusters versus independent versus low budget studio films? In your opinion, what are the advantages and disadvantages? Do you have any preferences? If so, why? I've kind of gone through different phases in life as to what type of movie goer I am. Uh, so like, in high school, I was very much into Hong Kong cinema. So John Woo, Chow Yun Fat, Jackie Chan, Sammo Hong, Yoon Biao, uh, Ringo Lam. I mean, Sue Hark, that type of stuff. The whether the gun movies uh, with John Woo or the martial arts stuff like Jackie Chan. I watched a lot of that stuff. Then around eighteen to twenty three, I started watching a lot of just indie film and classic films. And so then, like I saw Memento, Christopher Nolan's first bigger movie that wasn't just totally independent. So I saw that one in the theater. John Favreau's first directorial film named, called Made is an independent film. Very simple uh, comedy, very realistic. Like Donnie Darko, I saw that right when it first came out. I even saw a director's cut of it with the director in the room doing a Q&A. Big fan of Wes Anderson early on. Now he's basically mainstream and big budget and ma movies make over $100 million. Early on, that was not the case. And so I was kind of an early adopter of sorts. Uh, Garden State, the last one I rem remember seeing in the theater was The Squid and the Whale, uh, which is an early Jesse Eisenberg film and just very realistic portrayal of divorce and family dynamics and uh, really hard to watch because it is so grounded and real. Um, so that was the last one I went to go see. And then really the last 10 years or so of my life, um, I've been very much a blockbuster type guy. Uh, just the simple reason. I don't live near an art house theater. Uh, I'm too busy, stressed out to want to go and have too much drama and stress in my actual life to want to go see a grounded, realistic drama and feel sad from a movie I'm watching. So I tend to watch movies that um, are escapism. They are just kind of fun, dumb action movies, comedies, superhero movies, a lot of indie stuff. If I watched it, I would enjoy it. I would say positive things about it. I'd probably give it a great review. I just wouldn't want to watch it again. And so movies have very much been kind of a form of entertainment for me for the last 10 years, more so than something deeper. And the artistic side to it is a little bit lost on me just because it, it just doesn't match with what I'm my stage of life per se. What are the advantages and disadvantages of each of the di different types? So obviously with big studio movies and blockbusters, you have the resources and power to do incredible things. And some of the stuff that's come out in the last year with the photo realism of the Jungle Book is just jaw dropping what they're able to do now. Uh, the disadvantage of big studio movies is that you uh, they are prone towards risk aversion because they're putting so much money into it uh, every studio had once some input into it. They have thoughts on it. They don't want to take a big gamble with this much money. Therefore, they aim towards brands, franchises, adaptations, things where there's a built-in audience that they know how to market the movie to from the get-go. Therefore, you get very vanilla fast food type movies. Uh, and that's Look at this past summer. That's exactly what we've got. It's a bunch of Taco Bell, a bunch of McDonald's type movies that... It's good enough while you're eating it, but it's not great. It's not a great meal. It just... With mid-budget type studio films, the studios don't really make them much anymore. Besides like comedies and maybe some dramas. But this middle point is kind of disappearing. That it's not like the 80s and 90s with all these spec scripts and original ideas. And these movies coming out that were right there in the middle. That's kind of uncommon. Like Jason Statham is the only guy that's kind of the action movie, middle budget type guy. With indie films, because they're restricted on their budget, it forces them to have a great script, an interesting story, an idea that, that's worth telling. And um, therefore you see some really, and it pushes you. Restraints on budget and constraints like that force you to be creative in ways that you wouldn't otherwise be creative. Now on the con, you don't have the resources to do a lot of things. And so then the budget is also a restriction and um, a lot of times they don't have the resources to pull off the ideas that they have. They don't have the cast to make it good. And so there might be a great idea that's executed poorly. 
Um, whereas when you look at um, big budget movies, they have they're executed with extreme excellence in so many areas. They just are executing something terrible, um, which is so many uh, so many of the blockbusters. We'll finish out with a bunch of Star Trek questions. Mr. Spock asks, who is more hardcore, Kirk or Picard? I personally think Kirk. Thanks. So the obvious answer is Kirk because he's the cowboy. He's the rogue. He's the guy that went on the missions all by himself and would get in the fist fights. That's uh, you know, Star Trek three ending with him in a fist fight with a Klingon on a planet on a planet, on a planet that's exploding. You know, you just think him and you think the rough and tumbler. And that's generally what we think of when it comes to these types of things. And even beyond that, you just kind of go through the classic episodes. He fights the Gorn and he finds a way to make a gun out of random items he finds on this planet. In Star Trek Three, he uh, decides to kill all of the Klingons by blowing up his ship. He steals the Enterprise from Starfleet right out of a star base and like maneuvers everything to make it happen. He's a guy that at the end of Star Trek V says to this God figure, what does God need with a starship? I mean, clearly this is a guy that is hardcore. He is a, the fighter. He's all of that stuff. But we forget that Picard is also a pretty hardcore guy himself. So if you look at Picard, this is a guy that in Starfleet, we learn in the episode Tapestry, was kind of a bar fighter and got stabbed in the heart. Like we forget about that, those types of stories, because we think of him as the guy that uses diplomacy, that uses his brain, that works with people. But he's a guy that he gets in the rough and tumble. This is the guy that the Borg decided they were going to kidnap him in the best of both, both worlds. And they use him and his knowledge to like wipe out Starfleet. Like they find ways to use him that way. Later in First Contact... He's the guy that single-handedly kind of blows up the Borg cube by telling all the ships what they need to be able to do. In that same movie, he's going through a hallway and sees one of his crewmen getting, like, taken by the Borg. The guy asks for help, and he just shoots him and, like, kills the guy. We see him just locking and loading and going through the hallways just trying to battle these guys all on his own and climbing stuff. So he has definitely got that fighter vibe inside of him. And we forget that. So, but with all that said... I think just going back to what does the term mean, and if you got to pick one, I think you got to go with Kirk, because his first instinct is to be the rough and tumble guy, to, to go against the system, to rebel, to do it on his way, on his terms, to make it happen, whereas Picard plays by the rules, he is the diplomat at heart, He just he de we just don't want to forget that he has that other side to him. Uh, but you got to go, Kirk. Sir Ty Jensen asks, do you prefer Star Wars or Star Trek? Uh, I don't. I don't prefer either one. I like both of them. I grew up a huge fan of both of them. I went to Star Trek conventions all throughout grade school, all kinds of Star Trek conventions. A uh, huge Star Wars fan, as I showed you just a second ago. Um, this camera is sitting on a stack of my Star Wars memorabilia. I love both. And the thing is, is while... Culture likes to pretend they're in competition. They're just not. Like, okay, they both have starships. They both start with the word star, and they both have two words. But that's kind of where the comparisons end on any sort of reasonable level. Because Star Wars is science fantasy. It's mythology told in space, but it's very much uses fantastical fairy tale type language. That's why it starts off a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away. They're trying to replicate once upon a time with new language. It uses mythological archetypes for the characters. They're going on the hero's journey. And that like it's that type of storytelling that you see in Star Wars. You see mythical elements. And even to on a more practical level, the type of stories told in the ideology of the world the big empire is the bad guys. The good guys are the rebel rebels, rebels <laughs> fighting against the evil empire. And as people gain power in this world, they become evil and corrupt and it collapses. Now we get to Star Trek. Star Trek is written in a utopian future that's a version of our universe right now. If a humanist's version of the future came to be, and then we would get this version of the future. Everything you see in it has a technological explanation. So transporters obviously don't exist, but all of that has to exist in a world of technology as to how it does exist in this world. Likewise, it's a, like I said, it's a, uh, 
like I said, it's a humanistic utopia. This is a world where there is a big government that governs everything, and that's a good thing in this world, where people accept that, where it's kind of very socialist in nature, but everyone agrees with this because greed has moved on. We aren't driven by that anymore. Well, this is a very different worldview that's driving each of these. One of these deals with mythology in exploring the, the excitement that is in fantical mythological uh, ideas. Star Trek, on the other hand, deals with very current real-life issues through allegory and through stories addressing these types of things. So one is intentionally very grounded. One is intentionally very mythological and fantastical. And inherently, they're different genres Science fantasy and science fiction, they're not the same thing, even though they both have star in the name and starships. Eisenberg Compensator 47 asks, did you choose the thug life or did it choose you? Uh, well, I guess in life, people have indicated they like hearing me talk about movies and TV. As I try and share movies and TV with people, I tend to give a commentary and telling all sorts of backstories and connections and how it all fits together. And people seem to enjoy me doing that. So I decided to turn that into this YouTube channel and do that for more people. And hopefully people enjoy that beyond just my friends. Um, so, yeah, it appears that life has chosen it for me. Final question of the day. Does Star Trek portray a utopian future, no war, famine, money, disease, or a dystopian future, militarization, socialism, duty, groupthink? I think I'd answer one way reflexively, but maybe in more nuanced way upon some thought. Just me, though. First off, I would just disagree with saying it's militarized because it's not. They're on a peaceful, exploratory mission, very much so in Roddenberry's Star Trek. They are not a military thing taking over the universe. They're on a mission of exploration. That's why you have the Prime Directive. That's why they don't interfere, because they don't want to impose their view on these people. They want these people to discover things on their own. Um, so it's not militarized. Beyond that, I would say that Star Trek exists in the fantasy world of a secular humanist. This is his utopia. This is where he thinks his worldview will take things. His belief that through technology and through secularization, we will be able to take progress as a people to a point where there's no money, there's no greed. We all work together to explore and we can move past uh, mysticism. You can even read quotes from uh, Gene Roddenberry who says things like, Understand that Star Trek is more than just my political philosophy, my racial philosophy, my overview on life, and the human condition. This guy is trying to put forward his fantasy of the future. So he believes, through his humanism, that the more that we focus on becoming better as humans, we'll be able to progress. And if we use rational skills and shed the spirituality and religion of the past and work together as humans in belief in our betterment, everything will be better and we'll move past all these issues we see in life. I mean, he believed all religions would be gone by the 23rd century. He had weird views on, on marriage, and so you barely see any marriage inside of the original Star Trek series and or inside of Next Generation. So all of the main crew are single for life and a very weird kind of worldview. If you accept secular humanism... Yeah, this is a utopia. This is the future that you want, that you believe we're working towards, that we can all just work together in a crazy, fun, socialist society exploring this natural world that we live in. I, however, reject secular humanism. I don't believe that we're all inherently good. I believe that there are greedy people, there are lazy people, and that's not something that you just move past through technology and education. I come from actually a, a Christian worldview. My degree's actually in Bible. And I think that humans have an incredible p potential for creativity, love, compassion, but I also believe that there's something inherently wrong inside of us. Inside of us, there's a brokenness, a theological term for it would be sin, that makes it so all of us do bad things. All of us drift in greedy, self-promoting directions. All of us have tendencies towards laziness or towards prideful workaholism. And so the idea of Star Trek clashes with my worldview and that I don't think that even if we had great technology and everyone could be provided for, that that would lead to this wonderful, perfect society where there's no tension. I think our sinful natures will always lead to conflict, greed issues, um, desires for power, fights for power, and that creates problems. I don't believe that education and technology are the so solutions for mankind to overcome our problems. 
And if you look at the history of mankind, a recurring theme is man's inhumanity to man. Whenever we develop new technologies, we use it to harm mankind. And even within the last 100 years, even after secular humanism became kind of a worldview that had spread and all these ideas that we were getting better and better every day, after all of that happened, we invent nuclear technology and we start dropping atom bombs on other countries. We've been continually in war. We had a cold war. Now there's the war on terror. And you just see all of it. There's constant violence. And, and so while Star Trek is a wonderful fantasy about what could be in the future, I don't believe that it's a future that is at all possible. And so the question to me isn't, is it a utopia or a dystopia? It's a fantasy. It's the perfect version of a worldview. A worldview that I think is inherently flawed because it, it does not have an accurate portrayal of the human condition, which is to say that we are we are broken. I don't mean to get super theological. This is talking about movies. I just want to be honest with you and tell you who I really am. And um, that's what I believe. Um, so thank you for watching. Thank you for subscribing to my channel, getting us up to 100 subscribers. Hopefully this will be the only the first of these. I'll try and do more different benchmarks, or if there's just a demand for me to keep answering questions, I'll keep answering questions. With all that said, if you have any more questions for me, leave them in the comment section, and maybe I'll make more of these on a regular basis. Likewise, if you're watching this for the first time and you like my opinions, this is probably the one where you get the best idea about me and my opinions on stuff and how I think about things, because I'm answering all kinds of questions about a whole bunch of different subjects. If you like my talking, please click that subscribe button. Check out for more videos that I put out each week. Thank you guys for watching. I really do appreciate it. And I really do want to talk to you in the comment sections. I try very hard to respond to every comment so long as you're not a troll. Thank you for watching.